Hi all, welcome to this new episode of my podcast, A Digital Tomorrow. Today I'm joined by Alexi Grimm, head of fintech at the Bank of Finland. Welcome, Alexi. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's actually my pleasure to be able to, to talk uh, with you today and to get to learn a bit more from, from the Bank of Finland and all these uh, nice topics that we will uh, cover. Uh, the idea is to talk about um, well, digital, digitalization and fintech in Finland, of course, a bit as well about uh, CBDCs in Finland, because I know that uh, well, Finland is doing some work on this area as well. So it's going to be uh, great to, to hear from you on those topics. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, without uh, further ado, maybe I should start by, by asking you about the Bank of Finland. Uh, if I'm not uh, well, mispronouncing it, uh, Suomen Panki. I don't know if I pronounced it well. That's actually very good. Yeah, Solomon Panki, Bank of Finland. Thank you so much. Yeah, please um, share uh, with us like when it was created, uh, its main goals, and anything else you want to share. Of course, um, it's very simply the central bank of Finland, the national bank. Um, it's one of the oldest central banks. It's actually one of the oldest banks uh, in general. I think. Um, it's over 200 years old, I think 210 years old. So founded, yeah, 18, early 1800s. Um, but basically it's a central bank. It's the monetary authority in Finland. Uh, so you know, it has the usual mandates and tasks of a central bank. Uh, it's the bank of banks in the country, uh, the issue of currency and so on. And of course, it's been part of the Euro system since the start of the Euro. So we're part of the Part of the eurozone in that sense we no longer have our own currency but but for a long time we did um so now we're very much aligned with the, with the euro system i thank you very much for sharing um i would like to start maybe uh, uh to talk about uh, digitalization and fintech in finland uh, before uh, moving to the cbdc area and i wanted to ask you like uh, aside from from your work on CBDCs, which we will uh, discuss uh, later. How is the Bank of Finland uh, embracing uh, digitalization, uh, fintech innovation? Is there like any uh, particular uh, project or initiative that you would like to, to remark? So, I mean, Finland in general is a, as you know, it's, it's a high tech country, highly digitized. Um, our financial sector is, is very, highly digitized, we've had mobile banking and, and online banking for a long time already. Um, and in general, I mean, there's a really vibrant tech sector in, in Finland, um, different different areas of tech. There's a, there's a huge gaming sector and you know, there's a lot of, lots of startups. Uh, so it's, it's a very entrepreneurial society and, and very open market economy. So so FinTech, FinTech fits, fits right in. And we also have a very old uh, established quite solid uh, banking sector so fintech makes also perfect sense in the country you combine you know a strong banking sector with with a very high-tech industry then that um, leads to fintech and we're we're part of that ecosystem as the central bank um, you know, of course the central bank uh, cannot have a, a very direct role in creating fintech uh, solutions or, or, or products but uh, we're quite closely engaged with some of the companies here and try to help them and cooperate. Um, it's also nice because it's a relatively small country, so people know each other and companies you know, all work together. So, so it, it's, it's a really nice environment for, for that kind of industry. Is there any particular project I would highlight? Um, well, maybe not one particular project, but um, as a central bank, we, we both try to help with the ecosystem development, but then also use some of the best technologies around. And maybe what's happening lately is we've been doing a lot of in the area of data analytics. I think that's maybe an area where the central bank has been quite active. We collect a lot of statistics and we've been developing the tools uh, and infrastructure with uh, on, on how we manage our data and how we create more uh, insightful analytics out of that data. So that's maybe an interesting area we've been, we've been quite active. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you mentioned now uh, a bit about uh, the fintech industry in, in Finland. Uh, you mentioned as well that uh, 
despite uh, being a small country, it's a very high-tech country. So, um, to sum up this part, um, what advantages or, or maybe I should say what strengths and opportunities uh, do you think that the fintech uh, industry in Finland uh, has to offer? Well, one, one thing is that um, we are developing fintech in Finland as an ecosystem. Uh, so I, I know that early uh, when fintech um, was emerging, there was discussion on, on whether fintech will disrupt the banking sector or will compete with the banking sector. So I think from the beginning on in Finland, um, we've seen fintech as a kind of ecosystem where old banks and incumbents work together with smaller companies and, and market entrants. And I think that model has worked really well. So a lot of the innovation comes from smaller companies, but they, they work together with some of the larger incumbent banks uh, who in turn can provide, for example, some of the infrastructure and some of the account uh, systems, for example, payment systems and so on. Mm. So I think that kind of cooperation works really well um, and, and has really helped to, to, to grow the industry in Finland. And that's actually a very interesting what you just uh, mentioned uh, now, because this um, dichotomy between uh, cooperation or, or competition between uh, incumbent banks and fintechs has actually been going on for a while in, in most countries to the point that uh, I would say that in some countries they are starting to realize now that, uh, that we shouldn't be talking about competition but uh, but about cooperation no so you mentioning that finland uh, realized that uh, years ago is actually something very interesting yeah i think it has to do with also the fact that um so our, our banking sector is already doing quite a lot in, in in the area of digitization and digital services and people maybe were thinking that nothing's really broken in the system so there's nothing really um, fundamentally broken that needs to be fixed by fintech. I think we always saw fintech more as a as an enabler of, of new things and you know, bringing better services to clients. Not so much the kind of competitive. Um, that there wasn't there was never really that that strong of a competitive um, feeling there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, good for you. I mean, I think that's that's the right approach, and it's nice to hear that you um, well, that you realize that uh, much before others did. And well, now, now that you summarized uh, to me and to my listeners a bit about uh, Finland's uh, fintech scene, I think it's the right time to start talking about uh, CBDCs, you no know, central bank uh, digital currencies. Uh, as, as most of my listeners know, uh, well, I've done uh, extensive work on CBDCs, uh, writing many articles, and it's actually my main area of research and interest uh, right now. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, given that, as you said before, um, Finland is part of the Eurozone and Finland uses the Euro, um, has Finland done any tests on the digital Euro? And if so, uh, what results uh, did you obtain? So if we talk about digital Euro specifically, um, we haven't done any um, sort of technical level or practical level testing. Um, we started to research the topic quite early, already, I think, five years ago. Um, and we've done, um, we've, well, for example, we've done a, a hackathon where we kind of on paper tried to solve some of the questions related to the digital euro. Uh, well, the digital euro project wasn't, hasn't, wasn't started yet at the time. So this was about three years ago. Um, so we were more thinking in terms of CBDC in the eurozone. Um, what, what sort of question would arise and how would we solve them? Uh, so we, we kind of did a paper simulation, if you will. Um, so we didn't actually build anything, but we had a, a, a large group of people. So we had about 10 people who um, met a few times in workshops for, for a whole day and tried to solve different questions related to uh, CBDC in the context of, of the Euro area. Um, what came out of that? Um, well, one thing, one important aspect that we realized is that for a CBDC to bring value, it should really strive to be quite independent of uh, commercial providers. I, well, I think that's that's really the thinking behind CBDC often is that it's, it's a sort of public sector alternative to some of the payment solutions, especially in a country like Finland, where we already have a very well-served um, commercial payment sector and, and the banking sector. So it might 
you know, act as a sort of alternative, which is provided by the public sector. And in that sense, uh, it would imply that a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the components of that uh, service need to be created from scratch. Uh, so that's that's quite a big undertaking if um, you know if, if we would go go in that direction. Um, so otherwise, they would always remain that kind of lock in with some of the commercial providers, uh, which is maybe not really what CBDC is is all about. Mm. Indeed, indeed. And we are still on this uh, investigation phase. No? I mean, it was started in, in October, so digital euro is not yet a reality. I mean, it may take a few years before it actually becomes a reality. But um, to you, like, what would be the main advantages for Finland to have digital euro if it is eventually launched in the future? Yeah, I think that that's a really important question because um... The advantages are different depending on where you are. Uh, the Eurozone, the Euro area is quite a large, diverse region. Uh, and you know, the services, the financial services, the payment landscape looks very different in different parts of the Eurozone. As I mentioned in Finland, we already have a very highly developed uh, industry in that sense. Um, so we have you know, lots of different payment apps. It's highly digitized. Uh, uh, very strong incumbents and so on. So, what would be the advantage of bringing another another alternative there? So, I think I think the main alternative would be basically resilience. Um, as a small country, we are quite dependent on services and infrastructures which are uh, which, which um, are operated from other countries or which are dependent on certain providers from other countries. For so, for us, the main benefit would be to provide one more alternative infra infrastructure and thereby creating resilience for the economy that we already always have a sort of one backup option uh, for the for the payment infrastructure that, that's of course um, something that maybe that the average consumer doesn't think about but as a central bank for us that would be probably the main angle uh, for the digital euro and what about the main uh, challenges or, or risks i know that for example in Europe and in general, in, in the whole West, um, privacy, for example, is a big uh, concern. I was recently, for example, speaking at an event organized by the Digital Euro Association, where I participated alongside uh, some representatives, for example, from the Bank of Japan and other banks in Asia, central banks. And well, I know that um, that's a big concern like worldwide and especially in Europe. So what other uh, risks or challenges do you foresee aside from privacy? Or I mean, if you want to talk about privacy, of course, feel free to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, privacy often, as you mentioned, it often often comes up um, when when asked uh, about the digital euro, when consumers are, are asked and when businesses are asked about the CB or any CBDC. Um, I would say in, in Finland, privacy does come up, but it's it's maybe not the most important topic. I think there's quite a lot of trust in uh, authorities and and the how industries are. Uh, managed and standardized in terms of privacy. There are the usual concerns, of course, um, but it's maybe not one of the um, you know, one, one of the top concerns for consumers. Probably in Finland, uh, a, a risk that is perceived as, as more important is uh, the competitive aspect and the kind of disruption of the commercial market. Uh, so whether a CBDC as a sort of public um, public service would disrupt or potentially um, introduce unfair competition to the markets. Um, I think that's maybe a risk that, that needs to be taken into account because as I mentioned in Finland, the market is already quite uh, well served and it's, it's quite, quite a mature market with really good services already there provided by commercial providers. And uh, the question really arises if, if we bring a you know, CBDC into that market, um, it might distort the market somehow, and then you know create unfair, uh, sort of un unfair competitive situation in the market. I think that's that's the major concern that that we're having in Finland. And I wanted to ask you as well: How can uh, you, as a central bank, make sure that the digital euro doesn't uh, jeopardize uh, financial stability or? undermine to an extent uh, the effectiveness of uh, monetary policy implementation? How can we ensure that? 
Well, I think the best way to ensure that is to just to really careful planning ahead of ahead of launching a CBDC. Um, so there's really no rush to to bring it to the market un, until all uh, the risks and important questions such as these are are really carefully analyzed. Um, and of course, the, the, you know, if we think about financial stability, the the key concern, of course, is that uh, a lot of the funds from from deposit accounts would move into something like a CBDC. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure how realistic that risk is, or how how you know how large those those the, those movements of funds could potentially be. I'm not I'm not sure they necessarily are that big, but. It's of course important to analyze it ahead of time and to have mechanisms in place uh, already at launch, which would then mitigate that that risk. For example, by introducing limits on on how much can be on a CBDC account or other other, other ways to um, kind of limit the, the the potential flow of funds between different types of accounts. So so I think I think planning ahead ahead is really the the, the key answer to that. And mm -hmm. um, well. Technology-wise, uh, as we all know, uh, CBDCs well, may be built in many uh, different ways. Um, for example, they may or may not use uh, blockchain uh, technology. I know that some central banks are avoiding blockchain, uh, whereas some other central banks well, admitted that using blockchain uh, in the CBDC area might be beneficial. For example, as you know, uh, there was this project called Project Aber in the United Arab Emirates in Saudi Arabia back in 2020. Uh, in which uh, one of the two conclusions that were reached were the fact that uh, DLT technologies were actually not only possible to be used in those cases, in, in the case of a wholesale CBDC, but also uh, beneficial. So do you think that CBDCs should ideally use blockchain or, or they shouldn't? So, I mean, in the Eurozone, we are mainly looking at retail CBDC. Um, so in that context, um, it's difficult for me to see uh, a reason to use DLT or blockchain. Um, I think that the main purpose of blockchain originally um, was to have a, a ledger technology which would work in an environment where you don't have trusted intermediaries or trusted central parties. Um, but, but if you think about CBDC, you by definition, you have a trusted central party, you have the central bank, which is uh, a trusted intermediary. And if you if you if you have a trusted intermediary, um, then maybe it doesn't really make sense to to use distri you know, a distributed ledger because you you know you, you can just simply have that intermediary take care of of, of the infrastructure. Um, so I think it, it, you know, if you think about it that way, uh, in that sort of context, um, I think blockchain is maybe not really ideal in a retail CBDC setting. You know, maybe in some other uh, you know, with, with other assumptions, other premises, but um, looking at from our point of view, um, it, it probably doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And there is one more question that many people ask, uh, which is, uh, what's the world's uh, first uh, CBDC? Because, I mean, we all know that China launched a digital yuan, so that's why, well, many people, including myself, say that, uh, that maybe the world's first uh, major economy in launching a CBDC was China, but then there was the sun dollar in, in the Bahamas back in 2020, 2020. Uh, but before that, there were some projects as well. There was, for example, uh, this Dinero Electronico project in Ecuador. And then uh, it was you in Finland, no? In the 1990s, you created uh, the Avant Smart Card uh, system, which uh, could be actually considered as uh, maybe the world's uh, first uh, CBDC and, and the only one that uh, that went into production uh, and it was many years before uh, we talked about digital yuan or the sun dollar so uh, I know that you wrote articles about this topic as well so could you please summarize what uh, this project Avant uh, was why it was relevant and why eventually you, you shut it down yeah yeah my pleasure so yeah so this happened a long time ago so i wasn't in the central bank or i wasn't even you know working then yet i was in university at the time but um so this was in the 90s early 90s and bank of finland developed and, uh, and launched a, a an e-money product uh, basically a, a a smart card where you could um, pre-fund the card sort of a uh, prepaid payment card 
And this became a, a widely known concept. I think there were similar products, similar cards in different markets uh, during the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and it became you know, widely known as, as electronic money. And of course, electronic money has since developed into more account-based systems, but, but the first uh, types of e-money products uh, in the 90s were, were these kinds of smart cards. The Bank of Finland uh, also developed one, and it was actually one of the very first ones. Uh, so they already started developing it in the late 1980s, and it was launched in 1993. Um, and, but of course, back then we didn't talk about CBDC, although the term digital currency was already used, but e-money was you know, more popular as a, as a term as, as, in terms of uh, the word used for that, that product. So, so I did a bit of research on that a couple of years ago. Uh, it, had already, it, it had almost been forgotten, that whole project. Um, so I, I, I managed to find some information in our archives um, about that project, and it's really interesting because many of the same questions that we're now asking about CBDC, for example, the financial stability question, will people move their deposits into these kinds of products? They were already discussed back then in exactly the same terms, and, and the product really wasn't that different. Um, even today, uh, a lot of the CBDC projects uh, envision some type of prepaid payment instrument, maybe a card or maybe a mobile phone where you can um, store uh, money on, on the device itself as an alternative to, a, to an account-based system. And that's exactly the kind of system that the event was. So how that story ended is that um, after three years, the central bank uh, came to the conclusion that it's better to leave it to the commercial sector to, to provide the service. So they sold the business to the commercial banks, a consortium of commercial banks. And these commercial banks, the retail banks, they um, offered it as, an, you know, as a product among their other products. So the bank customers of these commercial banks had the alternative to you know, use debit cards, credit cards, or this kind of prepaid e-money card. And the prepaid e-money card just wasn't very popular. It was more difficult to use. I think the, the fact that you had to always pre-fund it uh, before you could pay with it uh, was a, as a major usability impediment. Uh, so it was not very, not very convenient to use. So it, it was just simply easier to use debit cards. And over time, uh, the e-money the e card was used less and less and it basically faded out and was uh, eventually discontinued entirely. So I think it, it, it became a question of this kind of prepaid logic versus um, a debit logic where you debit a bank account directly. And of course the technology has advanced so that debit cards and this kind of debit based um, products have become cheaper and they've become more user friendly. So maybe um, they, you know, they became more popular than, than these kinds of prepaid, prepaid products. And yeah, that, that's basically the end of story for Avant. Yes, I mean, well, even though this was uh, discontinued and even though it wasn't called a CBDC back then, but e-money, as you said, I think it's interesting to see that the Bank of Finland was already working on something similar, something that raised the same uh, questions like almost uh, 30 years ago. It's quite interesting to see that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's something, that's one of the key lessons I, I try to bring up is that this whole CBDC idea is actually not that new. Um, if you think about it, it's quite logical. Um, so when the you know, internet started to becoming popular and we had more and more digital products, uh, we started talking about e-commerce and so on, um, qu quite quickly people realized it would be really nice to have money on the internet, like digital money, which you could just pay around. Um, and the idea of CBDC is the same or any digital currency project is the same. You know, how to put money on a on the internet, how to put money on a digital device, how to digitize money. And if you put it that way, then that question was already discovered 30 years ago and you know, thoroughly researched. And then it kind of went away for a while and re-emerged maybe five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And well, one of the key areas of uh, CBDCs, uh, especially when it comes to 
to their potential cross-border use is interoperability, you know, interoperability between different CBDCs. I mean, we are not there yet because very few countries have actually launched their own CBDCs, but ideally, if, um, if things continue going on like this, uh, we'll face the situation in a few years from now. So, uh, do you think we'll actually see uh, an interoperability between different CBDCs in the future? And if so, uh, how do you think we'll get there? Yeah, I, th I think when once we have many different CBDCs in different countries, um, then you can start thinking about how those CBDCs could interoperate. But until we have even one, I think we're getting maybe a little bit of ahead of us if we start thinking about interoperability. I mean, that time will come, but of course, we need to take one step at a time. Um, and in my mind, really, the first step is to make a CBDC work in one country first. And we know that payments, if we think about retail payments, um, you know, the vast majority of retail payments uh, take place within one jurisdiction. Um, so compared to cross-border payments, it's, it's uh, much, much more important in, in that sense. So it's probably the first step to make CBDCs work in, in one country first and then another country. And, and once we get to the step where several countries have their own CBDCs, I think there's, you know, then, then it's maybe the time to look at how to make cross-border work. Um, but I would, I would rather take one step at a time and then not get, get ahead of ourselves by thinking too much about the cross-border case right now. It makes perfect sense. I mean, we're talking about a scenario that will maybe materialize in, in many years from now. So it makes a perfect sense your approach. There is though one, one area, one, one product, which is um, by its very own nature, a global, and that area is uh, that product is cryptocurrencies. I mean, well, we all know that uh, cryptocurrencies have been there for a while, but they've become much more mainstream this last um, two years, uh, one year and a half, because we saw many institutional investors starting to tap into this market. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, like given the fact that uh, CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies because of many different reasons, uh, one of them being the fact that CBDCs are issued by a central bank, whereas cryptocurrencies are uh, well, as like uh, decentralized as, as it they can be. Um, could you please uh, let my listeners know uh, what's the, the Bank of Finland's B1 uh, cryptocurrencies? And how do you approach them? Well, I think we approach them very, you know, the way you describe them. Um, so despite the name, we don't really see them as currencies. Um, I mean, they are really how people use them. And, and the way people use them is more as, I don't know if investment is really the right word, but you know, they use them for trading at least. You know, trading, um, maybe almost like a gaming or gambling type of product. So they are a type of uh, service, which is, a, I would say, a category of its own. It's not really comparable to official currencies or, or other financial products. It's a category of its own. Um, so the primary use case is um, trading, I would say. And, and of course, the, I mean, te the technology and the product um, allows you to also use it as a payment instrument, but that's not really how people use it very much. Um, so um, until you know, people really start using it uh, as, a, as a payment instrument on a wider, on a wider scale. Uh, it, it's less interesting. Um, so as, as if it's just something that is being traded on, on exchange type services, then um, we observe it, we kind of monitor the development, but uh, it isn't directly re uh, related to the kinds, of, um, the kinds of businesses that we are interested in, which are mainly payment, payment based. Yeah, indeed, indeed, I agree. I think that um, cryptocurrencies uh, so far could be considered more as an investment asset class rather than an actual means of payment. I mean, you can, of course, uh, pay with cryptocurrencies and uh, like in certain uh, scenarios, in certain circumstances, but we are talking about very limited ones. And even in those cases, I mean, there are like um, issues, you no, know, because uh, cryptos are very volatile. So at least so far, uh, I don't think that cryptos are like the best uh, means of payment. Uh, they are rather, rather than that, they are like uh, an investment asset class, a well, volatile one, rewarding sometimes, no, but not an actual means of payment when you compare them to well, 
to to a to a fiat currencies, no, to or to services in the future. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can use them for payments, but it always comes with a downside. They're not really the best way to to make a payment. Uh, they're quite costly. They are, you know, um, they are. Uh, spreads in, in the in the exchange rates and so on um, so uh, you could you could call them maybe a, a payment method of last resort like if, if if you have no other way to make a payment then then you could use cryptocurrency to make a payment but they're they're, they're usually not the best way to do it uh, they, they come at a high cost uh, they're quite inefficient as a, as a payment payment rail um, so yeah i think you're right well um Thank you very much, Alexi, for, for your thoughts and for your time, actually. Uh, we need to wrap up this uh, discussion because we'll be running out of time soon. But uh, as I said, it's been a pleasure. I got to learn a lot from you when it comes to uh, fintech in Finland, uh, CBDCs in Finland, and, well, in general, to, to your, your views, uh, the Bank of Finland's views. It's been, uh, as I said, very interesting, very enlightening. And well, um, for that, I, I thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure. And well, to all my listeners, uh, thank you very much uh, once again for listening to this uh, episode. And please stay tuned for the next uh, ones, which will be coming uh, very soon. Uh, thank you very much and see you all soon.